A quick note before I start, the unprovoked aggression currently happening in Ukraine is unacceptable and heartbreaking. War in general is horrific and above all else, a human tragedy. I'm not minimizing that by talking about the financial economic impacts. Wars and financial markets have coexisted and often been intertwined for hundreds of years. Countries that have lost major wars have had their financial markets decimated, while global markets have been relatively resilient, even to major conflicts. Despite the relative resilience of global markets, crises and wars tend to reduce global market returns and increase their volatility. Some of the most extreme historical stock and bond market returns, both positive and negative, have been concentrated around wars. But drawing predictive conclusions from past wars is a dangerous task. Historically, the relationship between wars and financial markets has differed from war to war and through time. So attempts at timing the market or making tactical asset allocation decisions is, as usual, likely to be a losing game. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. I'm going to tell you about the historical relationship between financial markets and war. There are enough historical examples of wars devastating individual financial markets to make war a scary prospect for investors. In two of the most extreme cases, the Russian Revolution in 1917 and the Chinese Civil War ending in 1949, investors' assets were expropriated, resulting in effectively total losses for foreign and domestic investors in the stocks and bonds of those countries. Interestingly, investing in the companies listed on the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange from 1865 to 1917 yielded returns nearly twice as high as those on the New York Stock Exchange. But that all changed quickly as a result of the Russian Revolution, reminding us of the importance of diversification. This is a stark reminder of the role that relative domestic peace and success in foreign wars over the last hundred years has played in the exceptional ex-post results of the U.S. financial markets. Whether we can bet on U.S. exceptionalism continuing for another hundred years is an open question. German stocks took a beating during and after World War I, dropping more than 90% in real terms measured in U.S. dollars by 1922. During the war, from 1914 to 1918, German stocks dropped 67% cumulative. U.S. and U.K. investors also lost in World War I, though not nearly as bad as Germany. U.S. stock investors lost 18% in real terms, while investors in the U.K. lost 17% measured in U.S. dollars, buoyed by an appreciation in the pound relative to the dollar. Japan had a massive increase in the value of their stock market over the 1914-1918 period, gaining a real 63% in U.S. dollars. The world index lost a real 31% measured in U.S. dollars over this period. Germany was again hit with large losses during and after World War II, again dropping more than 90% from 1939 to 1947. Japan was even worse, with their stock market losing nearly 99% of its real U.S. dollar value during and after World War II. Investors in U.S. and U.K. stocks who tried to learn from World War I by getting out of stocks before the war lost out on positive real returns, with the U.S. delivering 22% and the U.K. 34% cumulative in their respective currencies during World War II. A global equity investor lost about 15% real measured in USD. Exposure to multiple risk premiums paid off in this period. U.S. small cap value stocks beat the U.S. market by an annualized 12% from 1939 to 47, and U.S. value stocks beat the U.S. market by 6% over the same period. As historian Neil Ferguson explains in Earning from History, Financial Markets and the Approach of World Wars, in short, there is no simple recurrent pattern. Investors did try to learn from history in the late 1930s, but they mainly learned how to make new mistakes, since the lessons of the previous war proved to have only limited relevance to the next one. This is nothing new. Financial markets are inherently uncertain, random, and difficult to learn from. On average, though, it should not be terribly surprising to see declining stock markets during times of war. Stock prices theoretically reflect the present value of expected cash flows, discounted at a rate that is based on risk. If times of war serve to decrease expected cash flows or increase risk, which are both plausible, drops in prices are to be expected. The other side of that coin, though, is expected returns may increase after a fall in prices. A higher discount rate means a higher expected return. On that point, despite the dramatic drops for Germany and Japan in World War II, the years following are some of the most extreme positive returns in stock market history. From 1949 to 59, the German stock market increased at a rate of 61% per year adjusted for inflation measured in U.S. dollars. An investor who got into the German market in 1939 had lost nearly everything by 1947, 
But had they stayed invested and maintained the ownership of their property, they nearly tripled their initial investment by 1952. Similarly, Japanese stocks appreciated at 28% per year from 1949 to 1959, but the previous losses were severe enough in that case that it took another 10 years until 1969 to recover the USD purchasing power of an initial investment made in 1939. To contrast the difficult experience for investors in Japanese and German stocks over these periods, globally diversified investors fared much better, losing only about 15% in real terms measured in US dollars. It is important to note that investing in the global market was much more challenging at that time, but the results remind us why diversification is worthwhile now that it's readily available. So far, these events have been extreme, deep in the left tails of stock market history. Taking a broader perspective, the 2006 paper War, Peace, and Stock Markets looks at 440 international political crises over the period 1918 to 2002 using the International Crisis Behavior Database. Based on these data, on average, an international political crisis starts almost once every two months. The authors find that international crises reduce world stock market returns by about 4% per year. They find large negative stock market reactions from world markets in the first month of a crisis, followed by lower than average returns during the remaining months, and a partial recovery when they end. The reaction from stock prices is stronger when a crisis involves basic values like a territorial threat, a threat of grave damage, or a threat to existence. Reactions are also stronger when a superpower is involved on both sides of the conflict, and when the conflict starts with violence. Confirming what we have seen anecdotally at the extremes, this paper demonstrates that investors in stock markets of countries involved in an international crisis see their markets drop about 2% when a crisis starts, and an additional 1% per month as long as the crisis lasts. Importantly, these losses are only partially recovered when the crisis ends, on average. Countries not involved in the crisis only tend to see significant negative returns at the start of the crisis. International crises have a strong impact both on average returns and volatility, with volatility increasing by slightly more than a third at the onset of a crisis, and decreasing by slightly less than a third when the crisis ends. The author suggests that political uncertainty may help to explain the volatility puzzle, the question of why stock market volatility changes so much through time. We have seen that stock markets do tend to react negatively to political crises and, in particular, wars. Bond markets have fared even worse, flipping the conventional wisdom of bonds as a safe asset. Over the last 121 years, five countries have experienced negative real bond returns for the full period, largely associated with wars and their aftermath in the first half of the 1900s. German bonds lost all of their value during the hyperinflationary period of 1922 to 23. Even the U.S. bond market has had major periods of long-term underperformance in and around wartime. Starting in December 1940, U.S. long-term government bonds lost 67% of their real value and did not recover in real terms until 1991. Similarly, U.K. long-term government bonds started dropping in October 1946, losing 74% in real terms by 1974 and not recovering fully until December 1993. This is not a cautionary tale about not owning bonds. It is a reminder that diversifying across stocks and bonds and diversifying bonds globally makes a lot of sense. Remember, US and UK stocks had positive real returns over the same periods. Stocks and bonds have generally been imperfectly correlated, and despite their substantial real drawdowns over some time periods, bonds are usually less volatile than stocks. While wars can be devastating, particularly for individual countries on the losing end, an important point for globally diversified investors to understand is that the worst historical global stock market returns have occurred in peacetime. And those peacetime crashes have occurred more frequently than major wars. Global stocks lost 31% in real terms in World War I and 15% in World War II, but they lost 54% in the 1929 Wall Street crash, 47% in the 1973 oil shock and recession, 44% in the 2000 internet bust, and 41% in the 2008 global financial crisis. In other words, if you can't handle the volatility and drawdown related to wars, you can't handle stocks, plain and simple. Finally, the last lesson to remember is that while stock returns have been volatile throughout history, they have been reliably positive in the long run. And for a globally diversified investor, the ride has been relatively stable compared to investors concentrated in individual countries. Global stocks have returned a real 5.2%, or about 8% in nominal terms, for the last 121 years despite two large-scale global wars, the Cold War, civil wars, revolutions, depressions, and pandemics. 
In total, there are 487 crises from 1918 to 2017 in the International Crisis Behavior Database, and here we are. A common response that I hear to these long-term data is that people don't have 121 years to wait. But remember, diversification between stocks and bonds, across countries, and across multiple sources of expected return, like small cap and value stocks, has dampened volatility, reduced extreme drawdowns, and increased recovery times after crises. In investing, we are faced with risk, which can be quantified with probabilities, and uncertainty, which cannot be quantified. The prospect of political risk and war falls on the side of uncertainty. In earning from history, financial markets, and the approach of world wars, Neil Ferguson finds that changes in military technology and government regulation ensured that one could never be certain that the next war would have the same financial impact as the previous war. But that doesn't mean there are no lessons to be taken from the history of financial markets in major wars. Ferguson explains, major wars can arrive even when economic globalization is far advanced. The longer the world goes without a major war, the harder one becomes to imagine. And when a crisis strikes complacent investors, it causes much more disruption than when it strikes battle-scarred ones. About how to respond to uncertainty, Keynes wrote in 1937, we largely ignore the prospect of future changes about the actual character of which we know nothing. We assume that the existing state of opinion as expressed in prices and the character of existing output is based on a correct summing up of future prospects. Knowing that our own individual judgment is worthless, we endeavor to fall back on the judgment of the rest of the world, which is perhaps better informed. That is, we endeavor to conform with the behavior of the majority or the average. In other words, only take as much risk as you can handle, even in, or especially in, bad times. Don't forget that bad times will come, and that you plan for them. And diversify globally in low-cost index funds. Thanks for watching. I'm Ben Felix, Portfolio Manager at PWL Capital. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with someone who you think could benefit from the information. We also discussed this topic in a special episode of the Rational Reminder Podcast.